Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our five-minute Bible study today. We are in Numbers chapter 35, one chapter away from the end of the book of Numbers. So I'm excited about finishing it up and moving on to Deuteronomy. Numbers 35, our main characters here are going to be Moses. He's the leader of the children of Israel. And then um, some groups of characters. So the first one is a manslayer. This is a not a specific person, but a group of people. A person who's guilty of manslaying or manslaughter is a person who accidentally kills another person, right? Not intentionally, but accidentally. That'll be important in a second. And then the avenger of blood. This was a person who was seeking vengeance against a person for killing one of their friends or relatives. In terms of the win on the Bible timeline, this would be approximately 1450 BC, right before the Israelites entered the land of Canaan. And directly related to that, we move on over to our map. The Israelite camp is not yet in the land of Canaan. They're still on the east side of the Jordan River. They're camped at the plains of Moab, which was just northeast of Pisgah, which you can see on the map. Chapter 35 is about a couple things. First of all, the inheritance of the tribe of Levi, and then we're going to talk about cities of refuge. So first off, cities for the Levites. This is verses 1 through 8. So on the plains of Moab where the Israelites were camp, God and Moses discussed the inheritance for the Levites. When the Israelites inhabited the land of Canaan and conquered it, which was going to happen in the upcoming years, each tribe was to give some of the cities within their territory borders to the people of the tribe of Levi because remember the Levites were dedicated specifically to the service of God at the tabernacle and they didn't receive a land inheritance so God was going to designate certain cities for them to live in along with the city the Levites were to receive a thousand cubits of pasture land around the city in every direction. That way their livestock would have a place to to live and to graze. The Levites were supposed to receive 48 cities total, and the number of cities that each tribe had to donate was dependent on how large the tribe was. So of those 48 cities that they were to receive, six of them were designated cities of refuge. That's what we're going to talk about next. All right, so then verses 9 through 34 talk about these cities of refuge. When the Israelites conquered Canaan, as I just mentioned, six of the Levitical cities were supposed to be designated as cities of refuge. Now, what was their purpose? If a man accidentally killed another man, he could flee to one of these cities cities of refuge to receive protection from anyone who wanted to avenge the dead man's blood, like a friend or a relative. If a person accidentally killed somebody, which is called manslaughter, you'd probably be familiar with that term if you're uh, in the West and, and know something about Western law. If this happened, then they would be safe in that city of refuge until the elders of the city had an opportunity to hear their case to determine whether it was indeed manslaughter or if it was actually murder. The cities were not to were not designed to protect murderers. Murderers were to be put to death to receive capital punishment. God says at the end of the chapter in verse 33 that the spilling of innocent blood polluted the land of Canaan and they were not to pollute the land that God was giving them. So more than one witness was was required to convict somebody of murder. So you couldn't just go off of one person's word and then put the guy to death. You had to have multiple witnesses. Now, if the death was, in fact, ruled an accident by the elders of the city of refuge, the manslayer had to remain in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. When the high priest died, he was allowed to go back to his homeland, his hometown, and no revenge could be taken on him at that point. He was free. If the manslayer left the city of refuge before the high priest's death, then if the avenger of blood encountered him outside of the city, he could kill him without legal consequences. So if you were somebody who had the unfortunate uh, circumstances of causing manslaughter, you should stay in the city of refuge and really hope that the high priest is an old guy. (laughs) And now for our application, a bit of a heavier one today. Capital punishment or execution for crimes has always been a subject of debate in Western law. Now, modern Christians, modern disciples don't follow the Mosaic laws that we are reading about 
in the book of Numbers. They were specifically given to the Jews. But these verses do give us some insights into God's position on capital punishment, his mind on the matter that we can take when and, and account for when we're having this discussion in the modern day. God actually demanded capital punishment for murderers, and he prohibited anybody from ransoming or, you know, somehow getting that murderer out of the consequences of his actions, out of receiving capital punishment in numbers in terms of the Jewish law. In verse 31 talks about that. Earlier commands, though, that are found in the book of Genesis appear to have an even more universal application. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, God says, quote, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. And so it is a terrible thing to kill another person because that person was created in the image of God. You're destroying something that God values and that he, that he made that is special amongst the creation. So God gave that command in Genesis 9 to Noah after his family got off of the ark. Now that command was not exclusive to a particular nation or just the Jewish people, but it was applicable to all of the descendants of Noah, which would be the entire world. So now, obviously, we're under kind of a new system under Christ, but as we think about the idea of capital punishment, whether it's appropriate or not, I think these are some verses that we need to take into account looking at God's heart on the matter in the past.